In this episode, we are going to talk about what we learned in the H2B cycle in 2022. I've got a bunch of lessons. I applied for a whole lot of employers this cycle, learned a whole bunch of lessons, took things from the prevailing wage all the way up to appeal with the OALJ. If you don't know what that is, we'll talk about it. So here's some of the lessons I learned. It's great to be back. Happy April. See you after the bump. Hi everybody, uh, I'm back. It was an intense, intense three month period here dealing with the H2B cycle. We filed a record number of applications in our office. I know both Trent and I were hyper busy. There were some other things going on behind the scenes. At one point, uh, I was discussing purchase of this law firm with another law firm. It didn't go well. We'll discuss it at some point, uh, but suffice to say, uh, there wasn't time to film. Uh, and with all of the energy that I had to expend, both taking care of these kids I have at home through the Om uh, Om Omicron, Om Om it was Om Omicron, Omicron, through the Omicron surge, uh, H2B filing, uh, just trying to develop both offices in North Carolina here in Connecticut. I just didn't have time to sit down and it's something that um, I wanna work with and, and find a way to fix, but hey, life happens. So we're here uh, in April, I'm filming this on March 30th, and I'm gonna give you some lessons that I learned through the H2B uh, season this year. So let's start at the top. First of all, the lottery. The lottery system I think is fair. So we had a large enough pool of employers and applications this year uh, to, to get a st statistically significant picture of where the lottery kind of put our employers. And sure enough, you know, we had groups A through G, our employers fell where you would expect them to fall in the lottery. We didn't have everybody going A, we didn't have everybody going G. It didn't matter if an employer was big or small, their chances for ending up in one of the groups was, uh, you know, random. It was completely random. So a lot of employers ask, hey, it's my first time. Does that mean that I'm gonna be disfavored for group A in the lottery? Not at all. Hey, I'm a long time employer. Am I going to be favored for group A in the lottery? Not at all. And indeed, many of our, you know, long time employer clients didn't do well in the lottery and many of our first time clients did. So it's, uh, it's all a grab bag. Okay, staying with the lottery, group A's, does it guarantee you're going to get workers? Yes and no. So it guarantees you have the best shot. If you get through quickly, yes, you're guaranteed to get workers. But especially if you're a first time employer, what we saw this year is that there was a lot of delay, a lot more than previous years. Whereas I could count on there being a 10 day response time if there was a request for evidence in the past. This year it was taking 20, 25 days. Uh, these were instances where our office was trying to push the Department of uh, Labor certifying officer to respond faster. But on the other hand, when an additional notice of deficiency is sent, uh, that requires a big response, maybe you don't want those uh, certifying officers in the case of a first time application to move faster. So what you're trading off is that you're being assured of getting workers, uh, you're trading that for making sure you get a certification this year so that your record in future years is clean and so that you can skip that notice of deficiency in the future. So I don't know if it's because uh, certifying officers uh, are, they just have an understaffed department. I did see a lot of help desk responses are on some notices of deficiency. So I think that's a large part of it. Or it's just the fact that the officers that are there might be the same number, but just like all of us, they're limited by what they can do due to these COVID restrictions. Maybe they're working from home, maybe life is just stressful, but whatever the case may be, there's been a much longer delay this year on notices of deficiency than I've seen in past years. Everything in the immigration system is slower. So this is just one more thing we have to get used to. So we did have some employers who got group A's, but they didn't get certified until like two or three months later because we were going back and forth on NODs so much. On the other hand, Group B, does that mean you don't get employees? No, you know, some group A's are gonna be delayed, some are gonna be denied. We had group B employers go straight through and in fact, make it faster through the whole process than some of our group A's and successfully get workers. Group C, not so much. Group C, you know, we did not have any group C employers, group C employers or later get certified in time for that first wave of workers. What are other basic things we learned? So one thing we learned is that caregivers or nannies, 
there you go. So we had both caregivers, so like home health aid type workers and nannies approve this cycle. Uh, that's really good news. So if you are somebody that needs a caregiver or needs a nanny, we feel like at this point that we have, at least in our office, developed some arguments that really do get you to an H2B visa. It's going to be custom made each time. It's gonna be custom made for each client, but I can confirm the caregivers and nannies are an absolute go. So, hey, that's great news. Um, the other thing we learned has to do with staffing companies. So we applied for several staffing companies and this cycle staffing company, if you don't know, is a company that hires workers just to hire them out to a second company. Those companies have to go through a bit more complicated process where they actually apply in tandem with whatever business they are supplying workers to. So for example, if I am a staffing company in Texas, I might be providing uh, employees right, staffing employees, staffed, uh, I might be staffing workers at a hotel somewhere, uh, let's say in Houston. Both that hotel and that company have to be on that application. What we learned for the ones that went through successfully where he had the fewest snags is that that partner has to be really good. So if you're a staffing company, it's not enough just to have a contract with a partner. You really want to have a working relationship with somebody in that partner's HR department who can be ready to provide the documents and evidence you need for a successful H2B application. That is something that um, is, is way too overlooked by too many callers that uh, we get to our office. My first question for your staffing company is always going to be, who's your partner at your joint employer organization? That's the organization that you're going to provide workers to. What's your working relationship like? Is is our office going to be able to work with them to get documents back and forth? Um, the next thing, I wanna give like a, just a big shout out to certifying officers. So by and large, my experience with certifying officers has been that they really do wanna help. This is a pretty big turnaround for what I saw under the Trump administration. Uh, again, not political here, it's just what I'm noticing. The Department of Labor has on the one hand been more exacting on some of these certification applications. No doubt about that. And as I mentioned before, responses have been slower. On the other hand, certifying officers have been helpful in getting us to a green light for applications. My lesson that I can give to you is when you're writing back and forth their certifying officer, give them what they want and be respectful. I always love to start my responses with, thank you for the opportunity to letting us perfect our application. And then I like to provide whatever the officer has asked for. And if I have a qualm with something that's being asked for, I will note it after I give it. Okay, so for example, somebody might ask for payroll data even though you've already provided it. I will provide that payroll data again if there's something I can modify in there uh, to, to better comply with the request. For example, they might ask for an additional year I didn't provide, I'll definitely provide that. But then if I have a qualm, I'll say, and respectfully, we did provide this before, we did provide you know, the data partitioned by temporary and full-time workers. We're providing it again, but this is what we think it showed then. This is what we think it still shows. So I can respond to the officer in a way that kind of pushes back, but I'm still respectful and I'm giving them what they want. And by and large, I found that certifying officers are willing to work with us. Even if you miss a uh, deadline for getting a recruitment report in or responding to an NOD, you still get a second chance, you know, but you have to pay attention to your email and you have to pay attention to your flag account. Um, the next thing I would say is on your flag account, your flag account is the official record of all transactions. So we had at least one incident um, in this cycle where an officer sent us an email, but didn't put it in our flag account. Account. And so we missed a deadline because we were paying attention to that flag account. We had filters set up in the email for flag account uh, pings. And we were able to successfully argue because, you know, this message where you asked for XYZ wasn't uploaded in the flag account, you still need to accept the slate filing. I would say that you, you need to, you know, kind of be aware of that. So the one thing you should be paying attention to is your flag account. And of course, whatever email you provided in your application, you got, you got to have access to that. But the flag account rules. So if for some reason you miss a deadline because you didn't see something wasn't uploaded to a flag account asking you for XYZ document, just know that you probably have an argument there uh, you know, to get a deadline extended. For example, a traditional shortcoming of the process has continued where certifying officers, I'm guessing new ones, you don't see their names, 
um, have been very confused between seasonal and peak load need, right? One of the key differences between seasonal and peak load need classifications in H2B is that for peak load, you cannot have employed somebody in a certain position before for that time period. For seasonal, that's not the case. Yet seasonal applications are still denied based on what I believe is a peak load definition. I'm gonna have an extended video on this before, but just know whenever you're getting a notice of deficiency saying you haven't proven temporary need and there's some sort of qualm over your application for seasonal, one thing you should be thinking about is arguing for both seasonal and peak load in the alternative, meaning argue for both at the same time because that gives the officer more choice. So even if they're pushing back on your seasonal application, maybe they'll approve it under peak load. And indeed, this goes to the next point. Let's say you think you really have proven need, but you get a denial. Think about whether it's worth appealing. So an appeal is not going to cost you anything. You, If you're at the Department of Labor stage, you're with OALJ, right? And OALJ is going to let you file a notice of appeal for free. Now you have to, you know, put in a mailing fee because you'll have to send a paper copy um, to the government attorney's office. But a lot of times when you file that appeal, if there's a clear error and you can argue it, the attorney will write you back and say, hey, you know, we agree there is a temporary, there is a temporary need here. You know, we'll certify it under seasonal or, you know, uh, peak load and they'll send it back to the officer to certify. So it's absolutely worth it appealing at the Department of Labor certification stage. Now, the USCIS appeal, if you're at that stage and you get denied, that's a whole different issue. That's a different appeal process that I'm not as high on. Um, and I still wouldn't recommend necessarily doing that unless you think you have a really strong argument because it's costly and I just don't trust the USCIS appeal system as much. But again, for another video. For now, it's worth appealing certification denials at the Department of Labor stage. At least that was our experience this cycle. So now let's go back. One, one of the biggest pitfalls that we saw this cycle is just SWAs, state workforce agencies. No, we've harped on this in prior videos, but know what your SWA relationship is and have that job order filed early. You want those details you know, worked out before you start the cycle. You wanna know where you're gonna be posting your job, how you're gonna do it. You wanna make sure your account is open. You wanna make sure that your EIN numbers you know, line up with your, with your SWA and your application with the Department of Labor, just pro tip. Another pro tip I learn Appendix C. So I am used to providing Appendix C attachments for 942B's applications. I'm no longer recommending that. In every one of our applications where we filed an Appendix C, the application came back and said, you have to either hand manually type this or give us permission to do so. I don't think it made the officers happy. So make sure that you're filling out the Appendix C online, that you're not providing attachments. You might not know what I'm talking about, but basically fill out everything online on that 9142B. Don't provide an attachment for Appendix C. This is very esoteric. If you don't know what I'm talking talking about don't worry, you can ask me in emails or in the comment section. After you get approved, you have to understand your cost of recruiting. If you're using a recruitment company, I'm all for using your recruitment companies, okay? When it has a per person recruitment cost, remember there's a recruitment cost that you pay the recruiting company and there's a recruitment cost that's gonna be incorporated in there, which is the immigrant visa fee. You have to pay both. You have to pay the immigrant visa fee for workers. You have to pay the recruiting cost. Okay, that's gonna be per worker. You gotta multiply that by the number of workers. I had at least one client who's very surprised by by that bill, even though we went over it and over and over it, I'm gonna make sure that in all our future work, you know, we're specifying based on the number of workers, what you're gonna to expect to pay when, but just don't be surprised at the recruitment costs. You know, this is not a cheap process. Recruiters are your friend. They're gonna save you thousands, if not tens of thousands of dollars in the long run. I still recommend using them, but understand those costs are per worker. You gotta multiply that by your number of workers. And then, you know, one of the final uh, big learnings here is that this process truly is intensive in certain periods. You have to have fast turnaround times, especially if you're in group A and group B. If you're in group C, group D, group B, group F, it's still worth it going through the full cycle to get certified uh, because it makes future cycles easier. That doesn't uh, change, okay? Uh, but each application we found, especially first time application, barring like landscaping applications has been coming back for notices of deficiencies. So just know if you're a first time filer, that that is going to be the case. You're going to get a notice deficiency. You're gonna to have to convince those officers that you're a business worth certifying because they know that once you're certified, your application goes through much more automatically in future cycles. So it is a higher threshold and inquiry in that first application, okay? So that's my kind of just general feedback um, on this cycle. 
Um, we are now starting to uh, file prevailing wages for the July cycle. Um, I will be back with a lot more videos. It's great to have everybody back. I hope you're excited to uh, have me back a little bit. I don't know if that's like egotistical. Um, I love hearing from all of you when you call the office, when you email, um, and uh, let us have like a COVID free spring and summer. Uh, let us get back to our lives. I know a lot of us have just had a lot of really tough years and, uh, you know, it's, it's a hard situation in the world right now with everything that's happening um, in, in Europe, but also the Middle East. Let's not forget that there's ongoing wars from Syria all the way to Ukraine. But let's 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 try to find a positive route. Let's keep fighting for everything immigration uh, related, uh, both with our applications and generally on the policy front. And I look forward to being here with you for many more videos. Take care.